in any organization, the data that you have is very often one of your most valuable assets. You never want to lose any of that data. And with that in mind, people employ a number of different strategies to back up that data. There's all kinds of different data that we have. And so it almost requires that we follow a number of different ideas and philosophies around protecting and storing that data for later. One of them is mostly the traditional tape backup. We have such a massive amount of data that one of the most economical ways to do it is through tape. But people will also employ disk-to-disk -disk backup so that you have an actual hard drive backing things up. And of course, optical technologies become a very nice way to store data on these very large optical systems. You can store gigabytes and gigabytes of data and store them off in a very small amount of space. So it becomes very economical to do. Database backups are a little bit different. If you've ever had to manage a database before, then you know the databases themselves are almost always in use. And usually when you're backing up a file, that file cannot be open, cannot be somebody using that file when you want to back that file up. Databases are almost always open. So usually there are some very specialized way to back up these databases. One method is to use replication. We have a database on one machine. We will take all of the data from that database and copy it to another machine. That way those machines are always in synchronization. If we lose the data on the first machine, we have an exact replica of that running on the other machine. But of course, if you delete everything in one database, it's going to copy and replicate that deletion over to the other. So that's not the only backup you should be doing for databases. You should also consider doing online backups. There are specialized ways, usually customized ways to actually back up a database even though it may be in use at the time. So very often you're doing your normal tape-based backup to your file systems, but you've also got a secondary backup that is backing up your databases as well. When we look at email, we not only have the requirements of backing up the email database, that's another one that's almost always in use, but we also have regulatory requirements, perhaps compliance requirements we have to keep up with to store this data over a long period of time. So for email, we'll very often back up the entire email database. We also, in most cases, have a backup system that can back up and restore individual mailboxes. Not only that, we can even do individual messages in that mailbox. So if somebody says, I accidentally deleted a very important message from three months ago that was in my inbox, you can go to this restoration software, go directly to that mailbox, go directly to the exact message that was deleted, and just restore that one message back into the user's database. Makes it very, very easy. And when you're dealing with email and so many different messages, that's almost a requirement. Windows is a very complex operating system. And when you're trying to do traditional backups on a Windows machine, you'll find there are a number of files that are always going to be open because they're always in use by the operating system. But it's still important that you back those files up. So Microsoft has created something called a Volume Shadow Copy Service. You'll hear this referred to as a VSS. That Volume Shadow Copy Service is one that allows us to copy files in a Windows environment even though those files are open. So very similar to the methodology used when we are backing up a database, it's very similar to what we're doing in Windows. We can back up these open files, have an exact duplicate of those files, even though they might be in use at the time. And a very popular backup strategy used not only in large and medium-sized organizations, but even in home environments, is one called an image copy. We're taking an entire system and copying everything on that system, making an exact duplicate of it, and copying it off to an image file. The benefit of this image file is that if we ever wanted to completely replace a hard drive, if we lose a hard drive, and we wanted to restore everything all at once exactly the way that it was when we made that image file, we simply take and copy everything back over. And now we've got an exact duplicate, an image of that system that we've restored. Makes for a very, very fast restoration. But obviously, we're copying everything back. Sometimes you can pick particular parts of the image to copy back. But this is really designed to do what we call a bare metal restoration, which means we bring a brand new computer in, we plug it in, we apply this image, and now we're back up and running with exactly the same configuration, all the same files as if it was the original machine sitting right in front of us. When you hear the words backup and you hear the words archive, you need to remember to keep those things separate. They are two different things. 
A backup is a method to be able to restore something should you lose some of the original data. Or if you need to go back in time to a previous version of the file, you can use your backup files to restore that information. The backups also provide a lot of security there, especially if you happen to delete a file, if a file is corrupted, if you lose a hard drive, you've always got your backup files to go to. And you're able to pull back even many different versions of those files. Archives, on the other hand, are designed for something that is moved offline. You've taken this from your immediate access and you moved it offline, perhaps to tape or to optical disk, or maybe it's something called nearline where it's available, but there's some extra steps we have to go through to retrieve that data. This would be data that we don't need immediate access to. It's something that we're putting off to the side so that we can free up room for other things on our real-time access, our real-time storage. We're very often taking archives and we're storing them off somewhere for a long period of time. There may be a regulatory requirement or it might be part of your policy to keep data for a year, for two years, for three years, and we'll take our archives, move them to a different site, and then we'll have access to them anytime we might want them. Just keep in mind that a backup is something that is copying the data you already have. You have duplicate versions of it, whereas an archive is generally something that you're moving off of your real-time system and moving it off somewhere else. You're not creating a copy. You're simply archiving it and moving it away from your original system. If you've ever looked at some of the properties of a file in Windows, and this is a really good example of one where I've taken a single file, there's different attributes associated with a the file. There's read-only attributes and hidden attributes. For the purposes of backing up files, there is an archive bit that is can be set, a check mark that is set as part of the file. And that archive bit is used depending on the type of backup system we're doing. If you ever modify a file, that bit becomes set. That check mark becomes checked. And what happens is now our backup programs look at every file that might have that particular check mark associated with it. So if you're doing a full backup of your system, your archive files don't necessarily have anything to do with a full backup. You're going to copy everything on your system, whether it has a check mark on it or not. And you'll have that full and complete backup sitting there ready to go. Then you may want to do an incremental backup. You may want to do a backup that says, I'd like to back up everything since the last time I did an incremental backup. You might do one of these every day. And what we'll do is look at that archive bit. Did anything change over the last 24 hours? Well, there's a file that has the archive bit set. I'll make sure I copy that one. Here's another file that does not have the archive bit. I don't need to copy that. It's part of my full backup. It hasn't changed in the last day. The next day, I'll do another incremental backup. The first incremental backup cleared all my archive bits. So the second incremental backup is only going to copy the files that have been changed since the last incremental backup. So you've got, you've got these tiny little backups you're doing every day of only the things that have changed in that last 24-hour period. That's a little bit different, for instance, than a differential backup. A differential backup looks at what you capture, what you, what you backed up during that full backup, and every day it's backing up everything that has ever changed since that full backup. Now, there's some advantages to doing an incremental backup versus a differential. There's also some advantages to doing a differential versus an incremental. So I created this, this chart so we can look at this. If we're doing a full backup, we're getting everything. This backup takes a lot of time whenever you're backing it up because obviously you're backing up everything. But to restore is very easy. You have one set of tapes. You slide those tapes in one at a time, and your system is now restored. Very, very easy. And as I mentioned, your archive attribute is cleared every time. An incremental backup is means you're backing up everything since the last time you did one of these incremental backups. That means it doesn't take very much time at all to be able to back this up because generally every day we're not changing that many things on our system. But that means you're going to have to have every tape, not just your full backup, but every tape that you did every day to be able to restore this. So this could take a lot of time to restore everything on there. You need multiple tape sets to do that. And every day we're clearing that archive attribute. Differential backups, we're backing up all data since the last full backup. Now, this means that it might take a little bit more time to do a backup, but the restoration process doesn't take any additional time other than having your full backup and your differential backup. That's all you need. The last differential and your full will cover the basis for you. And as we mentioned, this does not clear the archive attribute when you perform a differential backup. Now that you have this backup made, you have to think about how long am I going to keep this backup around? How long will I need this backup? 
from a short-term perspective, we need to make sure we keep all of these little short-term files around in case somebody makes a change to a document. Maybe we may want to go back to a previous version. So there's a good reason to have a short-term version of those files immediately available. Over the long term, we may need to keep data in our company for a year or for two years. There may be legal requirements, regulatory requirements that we have this data somewhere, whether it's on-site or off-site. We need a copy of it so that we're able to pull that off if we ever need to. We also need to keep in mind that these backups are our real data. This is information that is extremely sensitive. We protect this data when it's on our hard drives. We protect it when it's on the network. We also need to protect this data when it's on our backup tapes. Whether we're keeping our backup tapes and storing them on site, or whether we're moving them to an off-site facility, we need to make sure that they are under the right amount of security. The idea of keeping data off-site is a very good idea, especially when you're considering disaster recovery. If for some horrible reason a fire was to break out and destroy all of your systems in your building, you would want to be sure that there was an extra set of backups, an extra set of tapes that was outside the building. So if there's a flood or fire or something that could damage things inside of the building, you at least have need to have some contingencies and be able to at least restore the data perhaps to your disaster recovery facility. You should also think about how you're keeping these tapes. Imagine if you have all these full backups and incremental backups and differential backups. There's tapes everywhere now. There's a lot of management that goes into keeping track of how many tapes you have and what you're doing with them. And this is just an example tape rotation of what you might do. And usually we'll see this referred to as a son, father, grandfather tape rotation, where your son tapes are the ones where you're dealing with these daily updates. You're doing daily backups and you're having seven sets of those. And after that seven days has gone by, you start again again at the beginning again. So you only have seven tapes to cover that entire week. If somebody says, I need to go back to Tuesday, you simply grab the Tuesday tape, you plug it in, you're able to do a restoration. There are also father tapes, which are done weekly. And you may want to consider doing these something like every week for a month. And then at the end of the month, you rotate through those four tapes again. Again, these are only recommendations. Many places will have many different kinds of settings for the number of sets and perhaps the frequencies that they will use. And grandfather tapes may be done monthly. There may be 12 sets of those. If somebody needs to go back to July, you simply pull your July tape, plug it in, and now you can restore from whatever you had running in July. We spend so much time thinking about the process, the procedure, the offsite access to our backup process that sometimes we forget that we have to also restore this data. Remember that these tape methods that we use, the systems that we use may change as time goes on. So if you're replacing your backup units with other tape drives, remember you might have a year, two years, or even more tapes in storage somewhere that you may have to restore. So you can't simply throw away your existing tape drives. You have to keep them around and make sure that they're going to be available for as long as you have backup tapes to be able to, to use those. Whenever you get a call and say, I need to restore from two years ago, you plug it right into those old tape drives that you had and you're able to restore that data. You also have to think about error correction and error detection. If there's a problem with the tapes, you need to know right then when you're making the backup. You never want to go to the restoration process and realize there was a problem when we wrote this data to the tapes, and now we can't restore the data that was in there. So make sure that the backup is complete, and generally your backup software will have a verification process that it can go through to make sure all of the data on those tapes is complete. There's also an idea of making sure that you have set up your backup configuration correctly. Imagine bringing up a new system and forgetting to do backups on that new system, or forgetting to back up some very, very critical directories on a particular file server. So it's worthwhile every month or so, perhaps even sooner, to look through your configurations for backups and make sure that you're able to back up everything you might want on a particular server, a particular cluster, a particular set of hard drives. And that brings us to this last point of making sure we can actually restore data. So it may be good randomly to pick a file on a server somewhere and perform a restore from that. Can we access that file again? Can we get all of that data back onto our system? How long does that take? Do we need to get it from offsite? Is that process working? And ultimately, is the entire restoration process going to be one that provides us with the goals and requirements that we have for the data in our organization?